executive board. Oh, perfect. All right. We are here. It's uh, August 4th, 2012. Um, this is Jeff Bend along with Stan Cron. And Stan Cron is very active in the Edmonds Museum. And he's going to have a conversation today. And this video is a part of the Oral History Project of the Edmonds Museum and the Edmonds Woodway High School History Club. The museum will keep a copy of this recording for the purposes of historical research. And we want to thank Stan for being here today. One of the purposes of the, the museum is to collect oral history of people, particularly in the Edmonds School District boundary. So Stan, when, when you were born, your parents looked at you and they named you Stan. Where did that come from? Well, <laughs> my mother wanted to name me after my Uncle Charlie, <laughs> but Aunt Dora got mad. And she said, what do you want to name him that for? Mother got mad and named me after a sailor relative, Stanley Schumacher. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> when Mother was mad, you paid attention. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, so, Stan, um, tell me about where you were, where were you, when you were born, where did you grow up? Where were your young years when you were a kid? Where did you grow up? Greenwood District, Greenwood. basically, yeah. Uh, third and 74th. And Greenwood bumped up, so a lot of the kids who live in Greenwood, most likely, that's part of Ballard. Yeah, that. yeah. And Actually, Greenwood was a dividing district uh, of districts between Lincoln and Ballard. Oh, I never knew that. And uh, Lincoln High School on the east side, Ballard High School on the west? Yeah. Okay. I that's in that. the high school level. No, I yeah. went to Greenwood grade school. Okay. And. A good portion of the kids I went to the great grade school with went to uh, um, Lincoln because they lived on the other side of Greenwood. Oh, I see. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, in your early years, um, do you remember like the, your, much about your grade school remembrances? I mean, what was your grade school called? It was a Greenwood grade school. Greenwood grade yeah, school. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, Mr. Kessel was a principal. Oh, okay. <laughs> Were you, uh, you know, a lot of high school students will be watching this from time to time. Uh, you know, growing up in, in a grade school in your in your era, um, did did you guys? Uh, did, what do you remember about grade school? Was it an easy thing or a fun thing or, wow? Was, do you remember much about grade school? Oh yeah, I remember. I wasn't anything spectacular. Yeah. Uh, I went to school. Uh, uh, a lot of mothers belonged to the PTA. My mother didn't, but I always knew she was home. Oh, so yeah. That today you don't find mothers home much anymore no, when the kids are in school. That, that's for sure. No. How many kids in your family? Well, was, my brother was 13 years older than me, and I had a sister. Uh huh. Uh, and she died when she was 10. Oh, that's yeah. six years before I was born. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I we, just have the one brother I remember. Yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, you went into law enforcement. Were you a, were you an easy kid? to raise when you were growing up? I was spoiled. Because <laughs> <laughs> mother didn't expect to have a, another child and she had lost her favorite daughter. Oh. And I came along and uh, yeah. Oh, you I had, had the best of a you poor had the world. Best. The best of a poor world. Oh, <laughs> that is cool. Depression and all. Yeah. So during, and you, so then you were, um, you lived in Ballard uh, really during the Depression years. Um, uh, People talk about the Depression years in Ballard in a lot of different ways. One of the things they talk about is the closeness of families and friendships and things like that. Um, were there any like uh, types of games and get-togethers that you remember that were really important? We played in the streets. Yeah. Played in the streets, uh, yeah. My father was a piano tuner repairman. He had a shop in back. Oh. And uh, we had a piano dolly. We used to swing that on the end of a rope with a kid on the end of it. Oh, on the streets. Oh, <laughs> didn't have cars on the street in the Depression. Nobody could afford to own one. Yeah. We oh didn't my, have one. Yeah. yeah. Oh, my God. Ballard High School has a long and colorful history. I think some of their school colors are orange. I think they're the beavers or something like uh, that. The school colors are like uh, um, Lincoln, reverse though, black and red. You're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the other's red and black. What do you remember about high school for you? On the, on the academic side, were there subject areas that you enjoyed more than others? Oh, it was funny. I loved math, but I couldn't understand it. <laughs> <laughs> you, what was it about you loved? 
Hmm? You, you loved it? Was there something, what was it? Oh, the like? math always interested me, but I went back to college later on and they had the new math and I couldn't understand it. I had to go back to what I learned in high school, so. And, uh, oh, God. In, in uh, your days as a young guy in Ballard, um, teenagers today, there's all kinds of things that they do that, that's unique to this time period. As a teenager in Ballard, um, were there, was there Friday night dances? Or, I mean, what were some of the things that teenagers did? Well, I was not a, a dance person, but they did have dances at a, at a, uh, near the Jane Adams School. Oh, okay. The Jane or John Adams School in Ballard. Maybe John, John Adams. I think Maybe it was. John Adams. Yeah, and they've torn it down since, the original school. When people talk about Ballard, I always hear about, I think it's Norwegian and Swedish ancestry. Yeah. And fishermen was the, f I mean, how big do you recall the fishing industry being, like your friends and your buddies and families? Was that really, really? Well, as a teenager, I worked in a grocery store in Ballard. Oh. That's, I had a paper route before that, and then I got this job for $20 a week in a grocery store. That was pretty good money, actually. Yeah, it was six, six days a week, 12 hour days. Oh. Oh my God! Sorry about that. It was sort of okay. That's yeah, all right. I felt like a rich man. Oh my yeah, twenty dollars a week was sure better than fifteen dollars a month. Oh my! Yeah, exactly. Oh but, my uh, God! Yeah, that uh, Ballard was. I worked for other grocery stores delivering. Uh huh. Uh -huh. A local grocery store. Two of them uh, deliver their groceries. And people in those days didn't go to the store and pick things out like they do today. You yeah. went to the store, particularly the neighborhood stores, handed him a list of what you want, and he went and got it for you. Oh, really? And if he liked you, you got a better grade of stuff. Than <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. But I know the one grocer, he carried the fishermen, a couple of fishermen. Yeah. They'd be gone for six months, and the family could charge up their groceries oh. there. And the minute those guys got off the boat, the first thing they did was pay the bill. Oh my. Yeah. So that was kind of like the local uh, a way to kind of create, you create your corner credit. groceries, you'd call them. Credit. Yeah. And so, oh my word, that must have been huge. Without that, I mean, during those yeah. times when the guys were Well, the depression, you know, it, they were up there in Alaska and not back for six months. Oh my. That's where the, the store owner carried him. Jeez. And it was good business for him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. Um, Eventually, we're going to work our way down in our conversation to talk about Motlake Terrace yeah. and its unique history and, and your role as a police officer. You know, and um, you, you, So you, was that one of your first jobs? I was going to ask you about some of the jobs you had. So you well, I got out of high school. I worked in Lake Washington shipyards for a year. Oh, you did? And that was the end of the war. Yeah. Okay. And the draft passed me up. Ah, okay. So uh, then uh, I was thinking about drafting and engineering. Mm -hmm. cause that's what I was doing in the shipyard drafting. Mm -hmm. And then everybody coming home from the war had points better than I to get mm. into college. Oh. So I went to work with my father in the piano tuning business. Oh. Do you I've play been the raised in it, more or less. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you play the piano? Well, my amusement, not necessarily yeah, anybody yeah. else. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. So did, so, so a secondary job that you had was piano tuning. So now, your dad showed you I, the ropes. I worked with my father for 13 years. Uh, we, I worked for various stores. Yeah. And uh, then dad died in 1956. Mm -hmm. And I saw an opportunity. I lived in Mali Terrace since 53. I saw an opportunity to get into the reserves with a friend there. Yeah. And so I got to be 59 and I hired on full time. The old bit about you can't beat City Hall, join them. <laughs> <laughs> wow, Mount Lake Terrace in 1950, 52. So, so the you moved as an adult up then to Mount Lake yeah, Terrace. Yeah. I mean, and what year was that again? Fifty-three. There, what was there in 1953? I mean, the main bore. Well, there were quite a few. The cement block houses, two yes. bedroom block houses. Yeah. And they built those up until 1954, from about 1949 to 54. And then they started building wooden frame houses. What was the, what was the reason on the cement block houses? 
It's the very, very unique. Uh, some Cheap parts material, of, I think. Okay. And the uh, cement block. Everybody okay. wants to call them cinder block, but it's cement, cement block. Cement block houses. The floors are all uh, asbestos tile, brown asbestos tile, asbestos tile. That was cheap. Yeah. <laughs> oh my. I think a lot of it was left over from wartime products. It's like the flooring. Probably. Like because barracks. I, I know and there things. was a lot of military buildings that had that same flooring in there. Oh. Where was where, was there a city hall right off? The, do you remember when, was he, when city you first hall started? Uh, it was just a little two bedroom block house on 61st, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is gone now. Hmm. And then they moved up to uh, 232nd and 57th, mm -hmm. another two bedroom block house. And they added a library on the front and an office for the chief. Mm -hmm. The block house was the police department. Mm -hmm. And they added a big wing on the back for the uh, city hall. Oh, I see. Was there? Is, did it include a court? Yeah. The, the, the traffic court? The, yeah. Uh, you, that was part of the city hall. When, so you started with the police, you started as a volunteer roughly around 1956. So um, law enforcement, so did you say you went into the reserves somewhere in there? Well, that's what, uh, that's what it was. Is I, I traded oh, police at, reserves. I had traded at the gas station down there and the guy was a reserve and he talked me into joining him on Wednesday night. So that's where I got started. <laughs> what? Wow. Uh, so as a reserve officer, d would they give you like uh, um, off hours and things when they just you couldn't worked, get coverage? You worked at seven at night to one in the morning, once a week. Okay, once a week. Yeah. And, or maybe more often if it was an opening. Yeah, yeah. There was about, originally there was about 20 reserve officers, but when I went there it was only about 10. Yeah. And. Uh, then at one o'clock in the morning, you had a um, generally a student dispatcher, and the officer went on the road. There was only one officer on the road in graveyard. Really? Yeah. Wow. And you guys, I mean, when ask a dumb tech, and then as far as like communication, you use the the police car radios. Yeah. Is that shortwave? Is that what that was? Like yeah. Shortwave system? It, it, yeah. And, and, and uh, we were on the same frequency as Edmonds. Oh, you were? And okay. the same frequency as uh, Kirkland and Houghton across the lake. So you could listen to the chatter of you the... You hear the stuff, yeah. So you could hear the Edmonds chatter or the Kirkland chatter. Oh, yeah. And how, how did you distinguish? I know, I think today, uh, if I'm an Edmonds police officer, they use the term Edward, for Edward one or well, something. Well, yeah, you, is that kind you of weren't that fancy uh, in those days. You used your your uh, personnel number. Oh, okay. Mine was four seven eight. Ah. And then the ten code, which is like ten eight, as uh, you're in service. Oh, okay. Uh, a variety of codes all the way up to. I think 1054 was called a coroner, and 1084 was a reserve a hotel room and a bath. <laughs> Ridiculous. Someone told me I think 1036 is a time check. Yeah. Something like yeah. that. And uh, so, but one officer in that late graveyard shift, that must have, because that's a pretty, I mean, although. It well, was we were about was two a, square miles in those days. Ah, okay, because I couldn't imagine. Now, Mount Lake Terrace is about four square miles. Okay, yeah. And uh, yeah, you were alone. Yeah. And you played the game by what you could do. Yeah. And uh, Edmonds has alone. They had an officer. They generally had a sergeant and an officer in graveyard. Uh huh. Uh, Doug Crane and Dick Moran. Oh. Okay. And uh, at one o'clock in the morning, when I started dispatching, part-time dispatching as well, and and mm -hmm. uh, I. 1957, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and they would call me up at one in the morning, say we're going on the road, mm -hmm. and I'd flip a switch, and all phone calls would come into Mount Lake Terrace, and I'd dispatch the Edmonds car. Oh, I and see. So the morning shift started. In real unique or tough situations, 
was it is it was it okay to consult with an Edmonds officer for assistance if there were like tough situations? Well, yeah, but they didn't know where Molly Terrace was anyway. Oh, really? Is that a challenge? I, I didn't know where Edmonds was when I got down to it. I mean, honestly, because things were so rural at some point. Yeah. In 1956, if you were an ad, I mean, address, it might have been kind of difficult to find places if you needed for yeah. more well, another Edmonds officer. Edmonds only went to Ninth in those days. That's right. That's right. It was just the bowl up to yeah. Ninth Avenue. So if you didn't know the county numbers, you wouldn't find your way in Mount Lake Terrace. Wow. In this day and age, in the year 2012, high schools often will call 911 and get an officer. Did In those days, did, did, did high school administrators ever contact the police for help or assistance on things? Once in a while. Oh, they Not did? Very often. Yeah. They tried to handle it basically themselves. So yeah. Wow. Once in a while we get called. I got to know them. Uh, mm -hmm. I've always believed that know your people, mm -hmm. know your merchants. Mm -hmm. Know your people that you're dealing with, and get out of the car and talk to people. But that's my my theory. Yeah, and uh, that and that makes sense because then you then you tend to build up relationships with people and organizations and neighborhoods and things of that sort. That makes a lot of sense. Actually, I met a lady one time on a bicycle theft, and we chatted for a long while. We became friends. Through the years, I heard about her from a gal that worked in the office, and she was widowed. She moved to Cleveland, and then I heard she met a guy in the laundromat, and they got married. And because we had been friends, we were invited to the wedding reception. Huh. And the wedding reception was Barrick, who was the principal at Edmonds. I mean, at Briar Elementary huh. or Middle School, yeah. and I knew him too. Oh. <laughs> Everyone sort of knows you. Everyone. It, was, it was kind of fun. Oh, my word. Uh, every time we, uh, did I say Ellensburg, I meant Clay Ellen. Clay Ellen, yeah. And uh, every time we go to Clay Ellen, we stop and see Jim and... Oh, man, oh, man. You know, um, high school students will watch this video, and one of the things, that a topic that's really difficult for a lot of high school students, whether it's Edmonds or Linwood or Meadowdale, is what existed in these four areas pre-1960. Pre because a lot of change would happen after 60, but in the 50s, and the time period you were a young, young man and you were in the reserves, um, tell me about what you know about the beginnings of Mount Lake Terrace, because it has sort of a unique beginning, something about an airport. Well, that's what I mentioned. This fellow wanted to build an airport down there. He drew up the plans, but he apparently couldn't get financing. Yeah. This is the story I heard. Yeah. And we got a couple of brochures uh, or a drawing of what he proposed uh -huh. and I don't remember how we collected them anymore it's been so many years yeah yeah but um, the lower shopping center of Mount Lake Terrace was mm -hmm. to be a terminal for oh. the airport but yeah. that's in King County oh, the county yeah. line goes right through the middle there oh it does and so uh, he had not been able to finance it apparently uh, well, Pierre and Peterson came in and bought the land and built the houses. Oh. The demand for low-income housing. Yeah, yeah. And a cement block house that was 20 by 30 feet, two uh -huh. bedrooms, 49.95. Really? At 4,900. Oh my God, that's awesome! And, and for yeah. ten dollars more a month for ten years, you could get appliances. <laughs> oh my word! Well, I mean, if you think about it, then that and kind of when did this all happen? Do you, do you was this like forty nine or fifty one or fifty two? What was that little window of time that you think you were saying, where the blockhouses, for example, forty nine to fifty four, kind of? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. It's, it's my present wife. Uh, she and her first husband, before he died, bought this four bedroom block house hmm. in nineteen fifty two. Mm hmm. And we're still there. Oh my word! Yeah, we move around a lot. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, yeah. So from from Mount Lake Terrace, uh, at the end of World War II, there was there was a need for families, and families needed to spread yeah. out. And cars made it possible for people to live in the suburbs and have jobs in the city, whether it be Ballard or Seattle and everything like yeah. that. And um, you probably witnessed quite a bit of change. So if you, uh, as a young man, you joined the reserves. And then when you joined the reserves, 
what were the next steps that happened as because then you somehow you so at some point you became like a full-time officer yeah well, they had a it they came I was 32 uh, yeah 32 years old mm -hmm. and that was the maximum age for hiring a police department in those days what do you mean I mean that was as old as you would go yeah if you were 33 you couldn't apply why was that that they had age limits on things really? I think basically they were looking at if you were, or older, you're not career oriented. Whereas if you're under 32, you're going to be there for 20, 25 yeah. years. Ah. So what? So how? So the transition from being a res on the reserves was it just you had built up enough experience years yeah. that at some point, because the city was getting bigger, yeah. they offered you full time. Yeah, I was. I was. Uh, there was the seven man department when I hired on. Like how many? Sergeants and is there a chief? One sergeant, a chief, yeah. and one sergeant. A chief, one sergeant, and then patrol five, officer. Five, five patrol, patrol officers. Then about fifteen reserve officers. Yeah. And the reserve officers work the swing shift. Oh, I see how that worked. Okay. Uh, teenagers will probably. How good were the cars? And what were the cars like in those days? Well, were they pretty our, reliable. Or? Our first car was a '55 Chevrolet four-door sedan. Yeah. If you see a picture of the cars in front of the museum, that it's one of them sitting there. Oh yeah. And uh, then we got a uh, '57 Ford as the second car. Uh huh. And then uh, we got rid of the Chevrolet and got a '58 Ford, and then it went on and on with about two cars a year. Okay, so yeah. it, it's probably through local dealerships and things like yeah, that, yeah. and just swap them out or something. Or yeah, that. Chevrolet, uh, we had about everything, Dodge, Chevrolet, uh, Ford. Yeah. yeah. Did you guys have to do like ongoing training, go to the gun ranges, uh, I mean, what kind uh, of yeah, training well, did you guys do? Well, we had basic school. Okay. And that was put on by FBI agents. Oh, really? Yeah. and. Uh, we went to Fort Lewis, and in my day, we went for two weeks. What did, yeah. what did you do there? Well, what kind like of training? Accident training, shooting, uh -huh. uh, uh, laws. Yeah. Uh, various phases of law enforcement. Yeah. And then uh, nowadays, it's three months. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, two weeks? Wow, that was compressed. Yeah. Uh, um, so you would, so. Every so often, you'd have the two-week training, like update or refresher, and uh, your cars had radios. And, and um, uh, you know, a lot of young people, when they look, they think about law enforcement. A lot of it, so much of it, is um, is your people skills, and uh, in working and working with people. Is that fairly true? Would you say? Yes. This has been. If I was to hire somebody, and I did hire some people. Uh huh. With other, with the chief, we worked on hiring. I looked for somebody that had retail experience. Huh. Sold gasoline, sold shoes, did anything retail because he knows how to handle people, or he shouldn't. Oh. He's got hmm. the experience. But you have somebody that's been in high school and college and everything, don't have the people experience. That's a good way to put it. You can make a you can make a better patrolman. I don't say. Because you're educated in the college, you can't yeah. be a policeman. I'm saying that it's easier to trans uh, transition into police work uh, if you have some retail experience. That makes sense. So the people that work with the public yeah. in, in a large fashion continue, the continuously. I, uh, well, the one that got me into it was uh, part gas station owner. We had another gas station owner. Uh -huh. and, uh, well, I always work with the public. Yeah, dealing with the public. You had experience working in a store at some point, and uh, and you have the natural temperament of you enjoy working with people, and so yeah. that was a natural thing for you. Yeah. Wow. Um, in the in the years you were early years as a police officer, um, were there any kind of wild wild experiences that that you recall? I mean, really challenging uh, situations that would come up. It was pretty rural, but still. Yeah, oh, it, uh, Mount Lake Terrace was a bedroom community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And out of a bedroom community, you have family fights. Oh. And there was a lot of domestic problems we had. Oh, and, okay. uh, and, uh, a lot of the people, uh, they worked outside the city. Yep. 
Yeah. They worked at Boeing or they might be in the service or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so the evening was the time when you had your problems. Uh, yeah. So an ability to problem solve, to diffuse things, to talk with that person, yeah. and get them separated and talk and, t and talk them down, yeah. probably was really, really, really Basically important. tell them to grow up. <laughs> <laughs> Having a sense of humor, you have a very good sense of humor. How helpful is that along in your police work? It <laughs> Keep, keeps you going. If you can't find something funny, no matter how drastic it is, you're going to fold up after a while. Yeah, uh, that's, boy, that's... I, weird funny. Yeah, times. <laughs> yeah, but that I could totally see it. that would be a huge way to in working with people. Um, so you started in '56 in the reserves, and wow, you went all the way through up to 1990 when you finally did retire. Yeah. Um, what other kinds of roles and kind of did you serve? You were a dispatcher. You were on patrol. Um, what other kinds of things did they were you asked to do in, in, in like sergeant or? Well, I was a sergeant for a while. Yeah. And I think it was about eight years, and then I was a captain for about the same at the end there. And uh, of course, once you get into the upper echelon, then you're doing more paperwork than you are street work. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we didn't have computers. Yeah. And uh, they were starting with computers, and we were using the Linwood computer for payroll and our budget. Oh. But. We only got a print out once a month, <laughs> so then I kept books so I'd know if we print. wanted to purchase something, how much money was in that account. Oh, I see. So I did a lot of bookkeeping that way. Yeah. And um, and oh. the roster, I had to keep the roster going. Uh, guys on vacation or sick leave or something like that, and you got to. You you tracked a lot of that stuff. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Wow. And you have to make those assignments or get somebody in overtime at times. And yeah. Police headquarters, was there a really small to, um, in that time, what did that look like over time? Well, How'd that change? as I mentioned, uh, it was a two bedroom block house with an addition of a, a library and the chief's office. Yeah. And the main living room of this little house was your entryway. Yeah. Side door. Yeah. The kitchen was used as a uh, photograph printing. Mm -hmm. uh, the front bedroom was used as a booking area, a oh. closet in between the front room and the uh, front bedroom was a dispatch center. Oh my word, and, all yeah. in one. And then the back bedroom, and there was a bath there too, that was the uh, cell, yeah. we had a one cell. And if we had uh, a woman, we brought them to Edmonds because they had a couple of cells here. Oh, I see. And if there was something much larger, you would probably have to take them to Everett or something. Well, yeah, yeah, but you tried to avoid that because uh, until you had some manpower. Because when there's only one on the road and you have to go to Everett, oh, who's you're right. going to mind the store? I didn't even think about that. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Would that happen from time to time? Were there ever situations where you had one, one in? And but you needed more space, and you were the one guy. Well, either that or you call somebody in. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I see. Maybe call reserve. That's where I met your father. Oh, you did. Yeah. Did I think it? Did you ever have to? I mean, behind you is the Edmonds Museum, the Carnegie Library, and the on the bottom right hand corner, those are doors. I think those are the cell doors, if I remember, because I remember hearing that we would ask and. Do, is that where you brought guys from time to time? Oh, we brought them in, in through the office here, but yeah, yeah, you could go in there, yeah. <laughs> Those are the cells, I guess, yeah. if I recall correctly. Oh, this door still exists. Yeah, oh, okay. This one's been blocked up. Oh, I see. And that's the cell there. And then there was two cells around the other side. And in the lower floor, I think the traffic court was held at sometimes in Edmonds? I, I suppose, I don't know. It's yeah. all we had. And you guys in, in Terrace? So there was like a city hall eventually w during your time period. Was there a traffic court for that as well? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. And then uh, uh, in '62, mm -hmm. they built the city hall again. They did the same thing with Edmonds. Yeah. You oh, yeah. It. About the same time period. Yeah, it was about the same time period. Yeah. And uh, and they tore down the old building. Yeah. And it's now a U.S. bank. Oh, you're right. I, I know the address. 
we have about five minutes, Stan, and I was trying to think, you know, uh, you're very well respected for your experience as an officer, and, and you watched all this change in Mount Lake Terrace. Um, gosh, from 1956 to 1990, there was a lot of change that occurred. Yep. And, and s traffic and patterns and people movement and buildings and construction and businesses and things. Um, it, thinking back to that, what were some of the other, any other changes that you can think back that people might not be aware of in, in the growth of the city? Um, well, in, in uh, what we call the downtown part of Mount Lake Terrace, uh -huh. which is 232nd and 56. Yep. About 1957, I believe it was, uh -huh. they built a row of stores mm -hmm. on the east side of 56, mm -hmm. and another row on the uh, west side of 56. Mm -hmm. oh, yep. And we had uh, dry cleaners. Mm -hmm. uh, a television repair shop, which you they don't do that anymore. <laughs> uh, we had a um, variety store, mm -hmm. and off and on a drug store, and a, and a, and a uh, this it was a spot, no spot tavern. It was a plaza tavern. Oh, I know that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then on the you cross over to this side, and you had a. In those days, you had a drug store, Summers Drugs. Mm -hmm. You had Double D Meats, mm -hmm. which is still there, mm -hmm. and you had uh, a restaurant. Uh -huh. uh, oh, around this corner was where they called it. Uh, they had the Gold Room, but this restaurant when when they took that out, they put this Gold Room and a bar in the back of this restaurant. Oh, <laughs> and, and then on the corner here was. Uh, the department store, uh -huh. Gulner's department store. Yeah. And then uh, you had, uh, well, I hadn't built that tavern, a spot tavern there. Mm -hmm. That came later. Mm -hmm. There was a building there uh, across from what U.S. Bank there, that was a post office at mm -hmm. one time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. And of course, then this was Foodland Grocery Store, yep. a Lucky Store, and now it's uh, Rogers. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I learned, to, I learned to play soccer not too far over there at that oh. big old dirt field over in Lake Terrace. We <laughs> all played soccer yeah. there. First place in all Snohomish County and everything. And uh, um, Stan, uh, uh, you know, we're going to wrap it up. Uh, if you were to think about any words of wisdom to current high school students, whether they're at Mont Lake Terrace or Linwood or Edmonds Woodway or Meadowdale, any last words of wisdom for the for young high school guys? Because I bet when you were on patrol, you probably encountered high school kids from time to time. Any words of wisdom that, that you could pass on? You can think well, of. Well, that, that's kind of a hard answer. I, I know. I, I didn't say it was an easy one. <laughs> yeah. uh, I would say this. I used to. We used to have career days. Yeah. And in those days, when I had a career days, I told them. Learn to use a typewriter. Uh huh. And I had a young man come back about some years later, been in the army, and he thanked me for that. Oh wow! Now, that's fine. Still learn it because you're going to need it on a computer. Yeah. Yep. The keyboard's the same. Yeah, that's really, really, and, uh, really true. And you got to get into the computer world. I'm not into it. Yeah. I'm a dinosaur. Uh huh. Uh, me too. Yeah. But the qualities that you have. Keep a sense of humor about the work that you do. Yeah. It's about people skills. It's about um, getting to know people in, because um, that's a really important point you made. In other words, as an officer, I bet you were quite successful. I've heard that from other people. Join join something. The yeah. Lions Club. Rotary. Yeah. Get into a, a, a service organization. I say that Yeah. sincerely, because I've been in the Lions Club since 1962. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a good organization. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, not decrying the other ones, they're fine yeah. too. But pick something you like, and because uh, today, young people are not that interested in joining clubs. Yeah, but it's fulfilling to give back, and the act of giving back to the community is, fulfill is, is, is fulfilling to yourself. Yeah. And that's why that's why everyone loves you on the Edmonds Museum, and your sense of humor and all well, that I've stuff. Well, I fool some of the people some of the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, Stan, thank you so much. All and right, uh, great job with the museum, and thanks for being here today, August of 2012. Yeah.